I am honored today to be joined by a panel of four incredible women who are on the front lines when it comes to supporting employees and employers alike in understanding and countering workplace anti-Semitism. Wendy Dornberg is an attorney advisor with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. I'm going to say EEOC from now on. Um, <laughs> Office of Federal Operations, Federal Sector Work Programs. Wendy provides oversight and assistance to federal agencies regarding equal opportunity and, opportunity and diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility issues, and provides training and outreach to agencies and stakeholders. My colleague, Donnie Nurek, is the Director of Advocacy for JLIN, the, company's, the country's leading Jewish values-based investor network, and now operates under the ADL umbrella. Donnie oversees all of JLIN's direct advocacy and engagement with corporations around six Jewish value pillars, and she has worked for a variety of organizations in the Jewish communal space in both the United States and Israel focused on education and engagement. Debbie Berman is a first-year trial lawyer at the law firm Jenner & Block LLP, Chicago's office. Debbie is also a member of Jenner & Block's Jewish Affinity Group and played a key role in supporting its founding. And Hindi Pipto is the SVP for Community Strategy and External Relations at UJA Federation of New York, where she oversees government relations around key priority areas, including UJA's work to confront anti-Semitism. Before coming to UJA, Hindi was the managing director of the JCRC of New York. So, as we've talked about all day today, in the aftermath of 10-7, ADL has reported unprecedented spike in anti-Semitic incidents all across the United States. From October 7th through January 7th, in fact, we reported 3,291 anti-Semitic incidents around the country. That's a 361% increase compared to the same period the previous year. And let's be real, where do we spend most of our waking hours? At work. So unfortunately, workplaces have been, they're not immune. There's been no question that unchecked anti-Semitism and bias in the workplace is deeply harmful to employees and businesses. With anti-Semitism on the rise, ADL is supporting employers and employees alike with concrete resources that can be found on ADL, ADL at Work landing page, including resources related to the creation of Jewish ERGs, employee resource groups. We've developed a critical partnership with, I promise I'm not saying it again, the EEOC, in achieving several of its commitments as outlined in the U.S. National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism. We want to create meaningful and lasting change on the ground and in our workplaces. It's going to require a whole lot of effort. Remember that just 60 years ago, Title VII was introduced. The notion that discrimination should not occur in the workplace was novel. Look at where we are today. Really diving in specifically for today's CLE on anti-Semitism. I hope that after our time together, you will walk away with a better understanding of the resources that are available to you if you face anti-Semitism at work and the role that we can all play in advocating for best practices in our workplaces to counter anti-Semitism in all forms of hate. So let's get this conversation started. Hindi and Donnie, I'm gonna start with you all. And I'd really like for you to frame for us, shed a little bit of light on how anti-Semitism can show up in the workplace. What, uh, what trends are you noticing and how are your organizations responding? And we'll just hop down the line and start with Hindi. Great, first of all, wonderful to be here. Good afternoon, thank you all for joining. I know you're not all here for credit, um, so thank you for those of you who are here and you're not even getting credit uh, for being here. I would say pre-10-7, um, and hopefully this resonates with all of you, the kind of incidents that we would hear um, went something like this. Um, my manager doesn't know that I'm an Orthodox Jew and I need to leave early on Friday afternoon. Or they may have heard of Yom Kippur, but they never heard of Shavuot. And sometimes when the employee would elevate their holiday needs, they would get a response that went something like, well, John's Jewish and he's here on, on, on Shavuot. And that kind of sort of casual, and I don't even, I wouldn't even call that malicious as opposed to just sort of ignorance mixed with some kind of like, well, that, you know, what about that kind of Jew? Um, obviously the centering of 
you know, Christmas, no one would ever, I, I call it era of Christmas, Christmas Eve, right? No one would ever send an email um, on Christmas Eve, but, you know, Yom Kippur, fair game, board meetings on the major Jewish holidays, I'd say Purim is fine. Um, we're not going to call that an act of anti-Semitism. So sort of generally not recognizing and honoring the needs of Jews in the workplace. Casual anti-Semitism, you know, my husband told me a story where people say to him, you know, Seth, you're Jewish, you should know the budget. Actually, he's like terrible at math. Um, you know, so all that kind of stuff um, that may, you know, may sound familiar um, to people in this room, but I would say the, the thing that we were working on pre-10-7, which in some ways, um, not for good reasons, has though become easier now, um, is advocating for Jewish affinity groups or ERGs in the workplace. I have had countless meetings with HR or DEI professionals where I walk in with a Jewish employee who's been trying to get a group um, um, and I see um, in the beginning just a lot of cognitive dissonance. Why does this person, who seems to be doing fine in New York, need their own group? Um, and often the first line of defense from the HR professional would be, well, we don't do faith-based groups. And then um, inevitably, someone Jewish will say, well, I don't believe in God. And then you know, the HR director, like, that's not quite the point. Um, but really, what was underneath that is a very serious lack of understanding of Jewish identity, right? We know for some of us, um, it's, it's a religion, for other, a culture, ethnicity, an identity, a peoplehood, um, a nationality of sorts. So pre-10-7, we spent a lot of time fighting for Jews to have community at work, which sounds crazy. And I would often then counter it with, with um, the President Biden said you have to have them, because in the, um, in the strategy memo that you mentioned that came out of the White House in May, it was quite clear. You gotta support Jewish groups, Jewish affinity groups, ERGs at work. Post 10-7, and I'll conclude with this. By the way, I wanna start with some inspiring things. Jews coming together in powerful ways at work just to be together. Vigils, memorials, moments of silence, um, unprecedented levels of Jews showing up at Jews at work, um, which for a Jewish professional is just an incredible sign of Jews wanting to be together and a moment around Jewish peoplehood and Jewish identity. I'll say one more piece of good news and I'll, I'll end on something bad, which you're never supposed to do. But the other piece of good news is um, there has been a plethora of official um, Jewish ERGs and affinity groups that have, have since been approved that now there's like broader recognition. Yeah, give the Jews a group, you know, just let us have a group at work. Um, and you see many more of those groups now being recognized and appropriately getting funded. Um, and of course, the bad stories are ones that you all know well. The gaslighting of Jews, um, the statements around every other issue, but not around this issue. Um, and I would all put that under the bucket of many Jews not feeling psychologically safe to be, who, to be who they are at work. And for many, that means having a kinship with their brothers and sisters in Israel. Thank you. And, and I'll jump off what Hindi is saying about Jewish employee resource groups being really such an important way to support Jewish employees in the workplace. I think now it, it, we're obviously in a difficult time where anti-Semitism in the workplace has become something more explicit. And the policies and practices we need to use to address it have to be more explicit as well. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we've been working on different best practices for companies to employ to both accommodate Jewish employees, but also other employees of, of other faiths as well. And what were best practices really need to become policies at this point. They need to become explicit policies. They need to be available, say, in an employee handbook or in an anti-discrimination policy. Mentioning anti-Semitism in particular is incredibly important as, as an issue. Sometimes we find, for example, trainings. There have been many trainings that companies employ, unconscious bias training, other anti-discrimination training. Well, at this point, anti-Semitism needs to be explicitly addressed and mentioned in these types of trainings. And I'm sure we'll get to, to more of it later, but the, the issue is that when this has become, these issues have become more present in the workplace, the ways that we address these issues need to be really deeply ingrained into company policies. Thank you. Um, Wendy, we, I, I started by saying 60 years of Title VII, and we only have an hour, so we can't go through it all, but can you frame for us what the EEOC, the role the EEOC played for both employees and employers concerned about the workplace and specifically anti-Semitism? 
Yes, thank you um, for that question and happy anniversary to all of us involved in that Title VII space. <laughs> Um, so just a little bit of background about what we do at the EEOC. Again, we were started under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and we administer and enforce civil rights with respect to employment issues and discrimination issues. Um, <clears throat> in general, the way that we do that is we receive a charge of discrimination from the private sector or from state or local government. We then investigate the charge, we try to resolve the charge, and we even um, litigate some of those issues in court. Um, on the other side, and this is where I live, is a federal sector side. We um, adjudicate cases of federal sector discrimination, and we also provide um, oversight and technical assistance to federal agencies. In terms of Title VII and kind of the legalese and how we relate to anti-Semitism, the first kind of, it's not tricky, but it, it, it's interesting because who is a Jew um, makes it unique in terms of what is Title VII. So Title VII covers race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. So who is a Jew means that we may be talking about religion, we may be talking about national origin, we may be talking about maybe race, and that's okay, it, and especially depending on what um, case we're talking about, Title VII, and um, anti-Semitism may be in one of these areas, and that's fine. And just to go over, you know, so we may be alleging religion, we may be talking about um, these other bases, and I just wanted to go over a few of the types of claims that we would see with respect to anti-Semitism. And those are disparate treatment, harassment, and religious accommodation. For some of you, this is like super easy one-to-one, -one, and some of you, um, maybe this is a good, um, a good review. So um, disparate treatment means that an employer cannot treat someone differently because of a protected basis. And you know, when we talk about that in disparate treatment, we're talking about some of those bigger decisions, such as hiring, firing, failure to promote. And as an example, I thought I would sort of go back to my own heritage and say, for example, a German Jewish person cannot say I will only hire German Jews because I need someone to be at least 12 hours early to every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> to, sorry to make fun of my own German Jewish heritage, but that, that would be illegal discrimination. If someone could prove that, that would be disparate treatment. Um, the second one is harassment, and there are a few ways we can prove harassment, but I wanted to talk about hostile work environment. So harassment is unwelcome conduct, both from a subjective and an objective perspective. And a hostile work environment is a work environment that is hostile, it could be severe or pervasive. And uh, severe could be something like a swastika. You don't need to have 20 swastikas over four months for that to be harassment. You can have one swastika and that can constitute harassment. On the other end of things, you can have a pervasive hostile work environment, and that means that there are these comments that are building up over months and months and months. And my, I guess my little tidbit here is if you see that something is happening in your workplace where it's building up, you want to cut that off before it gets to the point of illegal harassment. You want to say, okay, this is something that could get to that level, but we're gonna cut it off, we're going to address it before we get to the point where it would be illegal harassment. So we actually have an example in our proposed um, harassment enforcement guidance that specifically speaks to anti-Semitism. And this is an example of someone named Josephine, and she's at a barbecue. And all of these incidents occur at one event. It's not over months and months, but they call her Josephine, they, um, they say, why are you even working? Because you must have Jew money. They talk about how Jews control the media. So the fact that this is not going over you know, a long time doesn't matter in this case because these are severe comments. These are severe things based on historical um, inaccuracies, historical issues with Jews. So in our enforcement guidance, this is something we talk about that could be anti-Semitism. And the last one that I want to talk about is uh, religious accommodation, and that was mentioned already. But religious accommodation is um, just based on religion, and it means that if you need the, um, if you have a practice, or if you have, a, 
if you have a belief that needs to be accommodated, the employer has to accommodate that unless it is an undue hardship. And we may get into this more. It was a hot issue last summer because there was a Supreme Court case. But for instance, if you need to leave early on Friday, um, the employer would need to accommodate that unless it's an undue hardship. Um, and you know, one, I guess, last legalese point, and then I wanna just talk briefly about something else, that under our laws, under Title VII, an employee or an applicant is protected from retaliation whether they're opposing illegal discrimination or if they're participating in our processes. So I know it can be scary to come forward, but employees and applicants are protected. And I just, I guess this is more of a personal note, but I do feel grateful to work for the EOC at this time because anti-Semitism is an important issue for EOC. We have been participating in the national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. We have been training our federal employees and providing outreach to them to make sure that anti-Semitism is not something that is going to be spreading through um, our federal government. Our recently issued strategic enforcement plan specifically mentions anti-Semitism. And after October 7th in particular, and I wanna make sure to get the fact sheet name correct, we issued a fact sheet called Anti-Arab, Anti-Middle Eastern, Anti-Muslim, and Anti-Discrimination are Illegal. So that's kind of where we live in um, the EOC in terms of anti-Semitism issues. And I just feel very fortunate that these are issues that we're taking seriously. Wendy, thank you so much for framing that up. For our uh, online viewers, I wanna give you your first CLE code. Um, Debbie, I'm remembering that advertising campaign where someone would say, I'm the president and also a customer. And when I think about your role in a large law firm and starting a Jewish ERG, I feel like, I feel like you could be part of, that, part of that campaign where you recognize the need in your own workplace. Will you walk us through a little bit of what that, what that story was like and how you led that, what it meant? Sure, I'm happy to, and thank you for having me. And, um, you know, I thought we were sort of behind in the times, but um, understanding now that we were actually um, ahead of the times. So uh, just a very short history about Jenner and Block. Sam Block was the son of a cancer. So Jenner and Block, from its origins more than 100 years ago, uh, was a law firm that had Jews in it which uh, for those of you that are lawyers in major law firms, you know uh, many of those law firms did not have Jews in them. So that's the, the background on Jenner and Block. Um, and you know, many years ago we started a women's forum, and I'm gonna answer about the Jewish thing, don't think I forgot. We started a women's forum, and we did it be, not because we were having an issue about women in the workplace, because we had lots of women leaders, but we wanted to provide the extra support for the women in the firm. And then like many other firms and workplaces, we adopted many other affinity groups, LGBTQ+, veterans, uh, Afri uh, African Americans, lawyers of color, and also support staff we included for all of these affinity groups, not just lawyers. Um, uh, mother's Circle, uh, Father's Octagon, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some of them. Um, and that's where it sort of stayed for a while. And I think that, um, this is gonna sound odd, but I think that the Jews in the firm felt that they were comfortable and secure and didn't sort of wanna put a spotlight on themselves by asking for an affinity group. Because let's be honest, we are viewed by many people in many circles, both in the majority and in minorities, as a privileged white group of people. Where many of us are not white, we might be white presenting, and we're not necessarily privileged. We may have come from the same hard background that many other people did, but that's sort of the perception. So it's like, well, why do you need one of those groups? Because look at how successful you are. And so we didn't have one. And it really wasn't an issue um, that we knew about until after George Floyd and the rise of anti-Semitism um, that skyrocketed. I mean, it was nothing compared to now, but right? If you remember that big push into anti-Semitism, and some very junior associates uh, were brave enough to come to the firm and to people that they trust and said, you know what, we actually need the support and we want the support. And of course the firm said, 
Absolutely, and they created the Jewish Affinity Group. And so for about the first year and a half, it was very social about some of the things that you talked about. We made sure that, oh, when we had a Thank God It's Friday on the first night of Hanukkah, that there were potato lockies um, and not the pork and shellfish that they were planning on serving. Um, we made sure that the Jewish holidays got put on the calendar. Uh, I know that seems very trite, but um, it's really frustrating when you get the seventh meeting invitation, both from inside the firm and other um, what you would consider progressive organizations that you may be involved with that are scheduling things on Yom Kippur with the response of, well, we'll videotape it, so don't worry, you can watch it. And, you know, it's really a conversation that we have to have in the DEI space that inclusion and belonging means inclusion and belonging for everybody. And that videotaping it for me is not okay. I want to be there, and I shouldn't have to choose between observing my religion and uh, participating in things uh, either within the firm or uh, I see this largely in a lot of other spaces that I'm in also. And so um, we had that group, and it was a good place for people. Then October 7th happened. And all I can say is thank God we had that group because people, and, and this is why I think there's so many people in this room, we all want a safe space where we can discuss what happened on October 7th and know that people, even though we may not be 100% aligned on it, we're coming from the same place because people don't feel that way. And so what we've done since October 7th is we immediately had some phone calls. Um, we've had small group gatherings in our various offices. I've been fortunate enough to go to Israel three times since October 7th. So I've reported back to um, my colleagues about it. I. Um, got dog tags for people. Um, I ordered them from Israel so people could have them if they want, wanted them, and also the blue ribbons, and sent them to the various offices. Um, and, and we actually just had a meeting last week where people just needed to reconnect again. Because you know, as the tide is sort of shifting in the US, people are feeling um, isolated again. They're feeling nervous. Um, even though uh, they may have a number of Jewish people in their office, they want to know there's a space that they can go. And I want to be clear, not everyone at General Block who's Jewish views the world the same way. They don't necessarily view, um, they, I think everyone views October 7th the same way, but I'm not sure that they view things post-October 7th the same way, and that's okay. It's an open space for everyone to be able to talk, to be supportive of each other, um, but to know that there's a voice within the firm um, where they can be heard. So when the firm decided to issue a statement um, after October 7th, which we did, the affinity group did not request it, they actually came to the affinity group and asked for their input, which I thought was a positive, um, to see like how the people that you're speaking about are going to feel when they get that message. Um, and so I know this may be a question later, but my biggest piece of advice is, if you do not have an affinity group, do not wait for someone to ask you for it because you probably did not wait to start any other affinity group that you had at your place of work or your law firm. Go ahead and, and go ahead and, and start it and ask the people. And then the last thing is our group is opt-in. And so it's not our place to define who fits into any of the groups that we have. And so it's opt-in and we send the reminder out periodically because some people may not have wanted to opt-in before, but now may want to opt-in for other reasons. So. I hopefully that gives you a good background. Super helpful, Debbie. Um, so I'm going to go to our expert employer uh, folks on the panel. Donnie, start with you and then jump back to Hindi to really share with us what best practices are you seeing in the workplace and if you want to share some things that you think people shouldn't try as well because you see such a plethora of what people are seeing in meeting right now. Sure. I, I want to make sure to address a few different things. Firstly, we've mentioned Jewish employee resource groups and how helpful those are. I just want to add to that that those are not only helpful for building community and for supporting Jewish employees, but also in helping companies develop best practices, in helping companies know when holidays are. Those are really important for those reasons as well, even for thinking about a company's products, for looking at, say, an, a Jewish employee group that looks at a retailer's products that they're selling around Hanukkah. It's really important, too, to be able to have that cultural sensitivity. I would say that for anyone at any workplace to be able to advocate to start one of those, and even if you're not able to or it's not a company that has the ability to have a Jewish employee resource group, to make sure the Jewish employees do have a home and feel represented in multicultural groups and in, other, in a multi-faith group. So that's the first piece. The second piece, I would say, is for companies to support employees 
very explicitly with statements. We have right now through the ADL a pledge against anti-Semitism that companies are taking. It's really important for employees, and, and I'm sure you all feel this, to know that a company is supporting you. That's, that's a really important piece of it. There's also different best practices that I would recommend to a company. And if in your workplace these are not necessarily best practices or policies yet, having employees advocate for these things is something that really can move a company. We can advocate for it from us at JLens at ADL from the point of view of working with corporations as investors, but there's also a really powerful piece of having employees advocate for it. And I just want to get to a few of these best practices. So first off, I would say around holidays, having a holiday calendar that employees are able to contribute to, having input from the different employee resource groups, and then ensuring that when meetings are scheduled, they're taking account not only in days that employees might be off, like Yom Kippur, but also in what employees are feeling and celebrating at that time. For example, this is, this is another religious example, but we heard of a company that was having their big annual party event during Ramadan, and it excluded many employees because of the way that event was set up. Whereas if an employees, if they had a calendar, and this is what happened the next year, they were able to just move the timing of that event. Just a really simple fix. I would say around dietary needs, when planning a meeting, not to only have a best practice of asking those in your meeting if there are dietary needs, and this is both for religious reasons and otherwise, we see so many different dietary needs, but having that be a policy when you plan an event and whatever uh, you're using to plan that, have a drop down option where you have to click a dietary needs for employees to sign up. Also, prayer, places for prayer for reflection during the day, whether that's a room that any employee is able to use for any type of prayer, reflection, meditation, and also giving employees time and making sure that when an employee asks for something, the burden is not on that employee, making sure that it's the coming from the company. The company is saying, you have all of these rights. These are accommodations we're able to provide rather than it coming from the employee. And lastly, just really quickly, around dress as well. Many of our organizations do not have dress codes anymore, especially in a work from home environment. Many do, many have dress for your day policies. But even if there is no dress code, employees might not feel comfortable coming to work in a kippah or, uh, or any other type of cultural or religious dress if they're not interacting with others who are dressed in this way. So just having even a line in an employee handbook saying employees are welcome to dress according to religious or cultural norms, even that is just a simple way to really take that burden off of employees. And I would say also training is so important. When you are able to include anti-Semitism in trainings that companies provide, that's a huge way of being able to prevent anti-Semitism in the workplace and really demonstrate to employees that your workplace is taking anti-Semitism very seriously. Thank you. So let me just plus one everything you said, and I don't need to repeat it, so I'll just try to add a dimension to it. I think fundamentally what makes Jewish employees incensed or frustrated is when there is a perceived lack of fair treatment. So if a company never makes statements, no problem. Don't make a statement after 10-7. But when a company made a statement about everything and not that, that's when we're like, what the hell is going on, right? Or when every group has an ERG except for us. If you don't have any ERGs, no problem. We're not gonna ask for us to be the first and only. It's when it feels like our concerns, our vulnerability are not taken seriously, are not recognized, are pushed to the side, are poo-pooed. That's when you say Jews saying, what the hell is going on here? Why are we not being seen? Why does every other group get their thing, get their day, get their fair treatment, um, are, are recognized in trainings, and we're not? And I think that's fundamentally what it comes down to. So it's not an ERG in a vacuum, or an anti-Semitism training in a vacuum, as opposed to, if you're doing those things for many groups, let us have those things as well. So, so, so helpful. Jonathan encouraged us in the opening plenary today to ask the whys, to spend this time together really thinking about that. And so I'm going to popcorn down the aisle, but I'll start with Lindy since she hasn't flown in a little bit. Um, I guess it's a what and a why. 
what if we know that anti-Semitism anti in the workplace, just like any kind of discrimination, discrimination in the workplace is illegal, so what are the barriers? Is it, is it a gap in the law? Is it a lack of awareness? Is it understanding? Is it something else? Like, why are we having this, need to have this conversation now 60 years into the protection? Yeah, I think from EOC's perspective, and we've talked about this particularly in the context of our harassment guidance, that what we need to deal with these issues of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, others, is to have leaders and supervisors and even employees who are not leaders and supervisors, but particularly leaders and supervisors, hold people accountable and make it clear that anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. So if leaders and supervisors are not doing that, I think people feel that it's okay to engage in those type of um, misconduct. Fully agreed, I think it really has to come from the top. I think also there are barriers in awareness and understanding of being Jewish in terms of an identity that is not just a religious identity. That's, I, I think, something that really we're facing at this moment. And also awareness in just what are some of these policies and practices that could be in an, in an in place of employment. We sometimes see that people are just not necessarily familiar with what they could be doing. And once they do know, we are able to see some of those changes. So I've touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think people don't think about Jews as a minority. Um, and that's part of the problem. You can talk to very educated, well-trained DEI professionals in your workplace or at your clients or wherever, and they, it's just never on their radar screen. It's not malicious. It's just total ignorance. And you're sort of like, it's, it's, it's shocking when you're in the minority to be like, well, I don't see how you don't see that, but okay. But I think part of it is sometimes talking to the DEI folks and really having a conversation about what, that, what every facet that needs to include and what belonging really means. And I think that those are the two struggles that we have. And again, I think for most people, especially people in the DEI space, it's not malicious. It really isn't, I want to treat Jews differently. It's, I don't even think about treating Jews in any way because why do they need to be treated specially? Um, and so I think it's having that conversation and raising that awareness. Yeah, I'll build off on that. I would say that I think also it comes down to um, the way that anti-Semitism functions, right? And we know that anti-Semitism functions differently than other forms of hate. Anti-Semitism does not lead to structural discrimination in the way that racism does. It's a conspiracy theory, right? So if people's um, only notion of how discrimination works or when there is discrimination, when there's evidence of you know, hiring practices and those being discriminatory, and when you don't see that, when it's just a conspiracy theory, we're using very different languages and we're functioning with different paradigms. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, in many of my conversations with HR professionals, um, there is bewilderment, perhaps curiosity is a nice way um, to put it, about the very notion of Jewish vulnerability. Because if you can't see the discrimination, right, outside of a hate crime statistic, which I've learned is not always that compelling, although of course it should be, but if you can't see it, um, how and where does it exist? Because they can't see it, and therefore our whole claim about it is just met, again, with blank stares or um, it just doesn't resonate. So I think part of what we need to do is recognize that actually it's not self-explanatory. Being Jewish is not self-explanatory, what that identity means, and what anti-Semitism is is not self-explanatory. So we also need to take people along that journey to say, we get that there's cognitive dissonance, let me explain why we're saying what it is that we're saying. Super, super helpful. Um, I encourage folks, if they haven't had time, to either raise their hand if they want a question card or enter it into the app. Um, we're gonna be moving into questions very, very soon, but one more lightning round. Um, Wild and crazy. We'll bounce Debbie to Andy and then back around. Um, you've given us, everyone here has given such good advice and such good insight. Um, what's the one takeaway? Um, so you're going to get four takeaways, and it makes the person who Donnie's going to have the hardest job because she's going to have to answer last. What's the one takeaway that you want someone to walk out of this session with, with respect to how employers, employees, allies? Um, how can they help to counter anti-Semitism in the workplace if we know what's happening? 
So I've covered this a little bit, but I really think that um, if you're the employer, you need to have the awareness that there is a group of people that feel very isolated right now, and even before October 7th may have felt isolated, and that you need to treat them like you treat any other group that may feel isolated or feel different. Um, and that um, Jews just, you know, they, 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 even though they've survived and, and succeeded, that they need to have the same equal treatment that you talked about. And, th the, and I also think employers need to be very careful about the microaggressions, right? Planning stuff on the holidays, as I mentioned earlier, saying to people, you don't look Jewish. Well, I don't know what a Jewish person looks like because I see a whole bunch of people out here. A lot of people look very different. Um, or you can't possibly need that day off because of what you mentioned earlier because, oh, I had this in high school. The rabbi's son doesn't take off the second day of Rosh Hashanah, so why do you? Right. Well, because my grandfather was a conservative rabbi. What about, you know, like, but you have those conversations in the workplace where people say that to you. Um, and so I think that just having, raising the awareness and making an open, and, and comfortable space for people and making sure that your DEI folks have uh, Jews and Judaism um, on their radar screen as one of the facets of uh, what makes the place that you work a really great place and you wanna be able to treat those people the same way. Um, I would say the one thing that I hope people walk away with is that it's a very hard time for Jews right now and I wanna be clear about what I mean. Jews today are having conversations with their kids that their great-grandparents and grandparents had with their kids, and none of us imagined that we would be here today. And, I, and we're not oblivious to the complexity um, of our situation. My husband is the leader of his ERG, he works in a media company, and I see the painstaking conversations that they have. Are we allowed to put Yom HaTzmaut on the calendar? That's Israel's Independence Day. Are we only allowed to talk about anti-Semitism on Holocaust Remembrance Day? Is it okay to have a speech, but he's a rabbi? Are they gonna get mad at us because then we look like a faith? We are not showing up in this moment making unfair demands or unsophisticated demands. We are trying to navigate a highly complicated moment with newfound vulnerability, physical threats, and a highly complex political environment where people have differing views on what many view as our ancestral homeland. So we're looking for partnership, and we wanna meet that partnership with the sophistication that the moment demands, but recognize that when you see a Jewish employee in your office asking for something, I promise they really prepared what they're gonna say. They probably called their parent and said, does this sound right? Am I asking for too much? Am I showing up in the right way? And to honor that, vulnerability and the extent to which the Jewish employee probably thought a lot about what they're asking for. I would just say don't be a bystander and encourage the other employees, the supervisors and the leaders in your organization not to be bystanders as well. And that applies not only to anti-Semitism, that applies to Islamophobia, that applies to all the types of discrimination that the EOC enforces because we don't wanna to get to that situation where we're at the EEOC. That's not where you wanna go. You wanna be creating a respectful workplace before we get to that discriminatory situation. So don't be a bystander. Encourage the, those in your employment also to not be bystanders. You're right, it was tough because those are some great <laughs> takeaways so far. Um, but lastly, I would just add that to the employees in the room, to be able to feel like you have a sense of agency in knowing what are the policies that you could be asking your workplace to take on and being able to feel that. And I would say as employees, you do have a lot of power in being able to really advocate for your workplaces to make some of these change. And the changes you're asking for are ones that you have the right to have and are ones that can also make the, the place of employment welcoming to everybody, not just to people of Jewish culture and religion, but to many people of minority cultures and religions. You did well, even with having to take the floor. Um, before we move into official Q&A, um, even though I think I could keep going on with my questions for quite a while, I want to give the second CLE code. If you're online, the code is
I am going to start pulling questions that have been handed in, that have come in online and come in through the app system. And I can promise you that unless you are going to miss the afternoon session, you won't finish. So I'm trying my very, very best to group them. Um, and we're, we'll play popcorn. So when I throw one out, if it feels like something you want to add in on, let's take it. And as soon as we're done with one question, we'll bounce to another. So not everyone at all on the panel needs to feel like they need to answer every question. We have about 15 minutes um, left for the CLE time. Um, we talked a lot about anti-Semitism. We have a great question about anti-Zionism and where that falls into anti-Semitism, particularly asking kind of a fact pattern question here. Where have we gotten to the place where it would be considered severe and pervasive, the legal standard, um, to say from the river to the sea in the same way that it would be to put a swastika on something. Anybody have an opinion there? So I, I saw you looking at me. I would say, you know, political speech is not protected. On the one hand, race, color, religion, et cetera, is protected. So I guess based on the facts, you would really have to look at whether are we in the political zone or are we in that Title seven, seven zone? And I can't say that there's a specific answer to that, but you know, looking at the facts as a whole, looking with whether things are adding up, maybe that's one comment and then you know, there are other comments that go with that that are specifically based in those Title Seven categories, but I certainly can't give a legal answer of river to the sea is this, Zionist is this, you know, that's not something I'm in a position to answer to, but certainly I would say in terms of what you wanna see in a workplace, even if you're not in Title Seven zone, you wanna encourage a respectful workplace before you get to that pervasive or the severe situation. So if it's, maybe it's not gonna be a legal um, harassment claim, but you wanna create a workplace where people feel comfortable so that you don't go there with an EOC situation. If I can just add, I think that we have to reject when people say that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism after October 7th. If people want to say whatever they think about BB, fine. I don't view that as anti-Zionism. I don't view that as anti-Semitism. But when you say from the river to the sea and that I don't have the right for, to have my own home country and self-determination, that's anti-Semitism. And no other people in the world have, are ever told that. And I think that we're letting people have a useful crutch to say, oh, that's just anti-Zionism, so there's nothing we can do about it because it's not anti-Semitism. Well, I agree, you have to know the exact specifics of what's said. If it's criticism of the Israeli government, fine. But when it's talking really about the right of the Jewish people to have their own homeland and to determine their destiny, that's anti-Semitism, and no employer should support it. And if it's happening to you in your, employee, in your workplace and they're saying, oh, that's just anti-Zionism, I think you gotta fight back on it. And if you don't feel comfortable, the good news is you have lots of resources, including from the Anti-Defamation League and other really good partners who can help you have that conversation and have that fight, but we should, we should not accept that anymore. A lot of interest in what it's like to really run an ERG, to have an ERG. Um, so some practical questions, and I'm kind of grouping them together, so I apologize. They're each, each one is great, but they all kind of go to the same core issue. Um, a variety of, we're, we're starting up an ERG, or we'd like to refresh our ERG, or it seems like someone's already done this before, so why should we reinvent the wheel? People in this space, what, where do you recommend that people either go for resources, for handbooks, and what maybe does a Jewish ERG need that might be different? What can you not cut and paste from anybody else's? Um, I'm happy to take this one. So about two months ago, uh, we convened the leaders of Jewish ERGs in New York. Um, and as you can imagine, being a Jewish professional in New York, I go to a lot of events. But this event, honestly, was the most passionate and loud because they were so happy to be together. They were like, what did you say to your HR person about the policy around the chat for the ERG group? Like, how did you guys handle Passover this year? Just the amount of best practice sharing around the table and it occurred to us at Federation, okay, may maybe this, is, this in and of itself is a huge um, resource that we could offer the field. So I would say if you're looking, we've started a mentorship program um, where we have 
pe people who run ERGs within a sector willing to sort of be a mentor to someone else within a sector because we learned there are very sector specific um, sensibilities around ERGs, tech versus banking, you can imagine, very different. Um, and by the way, the banks are not allowed to share ERG calendars with each other. They're free. The SEC will sue them for collusion, which I also learned, and that was really interesting. Um, so number one, if you're looking for a mentor, um, we have them. Number two, obviously, the ADL and Project Shema have incredible resources. So when we meet with an ERG leader who wants to bring in anti-Semitism training, we call the ADL, we call Project Shema, and they come in and they know how to speak that language. A lot of what we also hear is that people need help making the case for a Jewish ERG, and often the best way to make the case is to see, look who else has one. So we've been keeping a list along with Project Shema and others of all the companies that have recognized Jewish ERGs, and sometimes that's your best point, right? Because you know no company wants to be left out of their peers around anything, particularly this. Um, so mentorship, making the case for Jewish ERGs, and a lot of Jewish ERGs are just looking for great programming ideas. Um, so we've also put together sort of like a Google Drive sharing those programming ideas, and we're happy to make that available. Fantastic. Anybody else? Um, I'll, I'll just add quickly, because we have one. They're each going to be different. First of all, each affinity group in our firm is different, and each Jewish affinity group is going to be different, because it depends who's in it and what they're looking for to get out of it. So I think you have to listen to the people who show up. Like, I would have a first opt-in meeting and see who's there and ask them what they want out of the group because it's a group for us, right? It's not a group that we're planning for somebody else, and, and so it'll be different. So some things like the calendar is a, like an easy no-brainer thing. Like, the, if the affinity group can help get the dates on the calendar, super helpful, including people reminding people that our holidays start the night before. So if they plan a meeting at 3 p.m. the night before and you have to travel somewhere, it's probably not going to work for you. You know, the food points that you raised earlier. Um, Jewish Heritage Month is coming up. My guess is that most of your uh, places of work or law firms or whatever may have um, speakers for Black History Month, for Women's Month, and nothing for Jewish Heritage Month. And it doesn't necessarily have to be religious. It doesn't necessarily have to be about what's going on in Israel right now. There might be some other topic that you're interested in. Maybe people want a book club. Maybe they just want to get together once a month in a safe space to talk. But I would listen to what people want and then go that way. A group of questions also kind of coming in on maybe almost the PR of starting up a Jewish uh, ERG or resource group on wanting to wanting to play fair in the workplace. How, how do you suggest that people deal with coworkers um, being upset that sometimes, particularly in the accommodation space, that if some people can leave early and some people can't. How does that play out? Is that something that you're seeing or, or people expressing? You know, I think we see this in the disability space. We see this mm -hmm. in the um, religious space as well. If someone has a protected characteristic, they're protected under Title VII or ADA or the Rehabilitation Act. And that doesn't mean that they're be being treated more favorably, they're being protected um, from discrimination by being accommodated. And that's not something that someone else should be privy to, et cetera, from a legal perspective. I'm sure others can speak about how, you know, you talk about that, um, you know, as a, as a whole, but from a legal perspective, if you are being provided a reasonable accommodation either for a disability or for religion, that is because of the law. I also just want to add to that, that those accommodations are available to everyone, and it's really important to stress that they're not accommodations that are made for Jewish employees, they're accommodations that are made for people of different faiths, different cultures. Anyone might, might want to and might need to use those different types of accommodations. Um, and also just how to speak about it. This is where I think it's especially important to create a culture at the workplace that is really inclusive and accommodating in different ways. And one of those areas is having trainings available. When people know, for example, why someone is leaving, say at 3 p.m. the day before Yom Kippur, that really adds a lot of color to why they might need that accommodation. So really important to offer those. Um, there's a lot of requests for more great ideas. So great ideas on calendars, great ideas on food, great ideas in so many spaces, but 
for people who want to start, not the formal requisition of like, I want an ERG tomorrow, but just to open the conversation with an employer, what in addition are the kinds of things that they could be asking for, for recognition in the workplace? What do you, what do you see working places? Sure, I can take that, and I would say also, if you are interested in this as well, I'll happily provide my email and people can be in touch afterwards because there's no way I could speak to the many, many, many different types of best practices we're seeing in the field. Um, so I'm happy to, to chat with you about what would be good for your workplace and what you're seeing there. I would say some of those best practices that I mentioned, even beyond that, for example, something like floating holidays is something that we're seeing becoming more and more prevalent. Very important when companies have more floating holidays, it's better for everyone. It's better for employees of Jewish culture and faith. It's, it's better for everyone too. Um, I would say being really explicit with those policies, everything I mentioned, for example, dietary needs or prayer time and space, really writing that into a policy. And that's something that you as an employee can look and see what policies you have in your workplace. What does it say in the employee handbook? If it doesn't say those things explicitly, being able to ask for those things is a really good first step. Was in that question also just more programmatic ideas? Yeah. Okay, um, a volunteer day, right? So most, um, most of you, wherever you work, there's probably a Jewish organization near you that could arrange a volunteer day. It's a wonderful way to Jews show up in the workplace um, and really engage outside of the office. The other thing that I would say is, no matter where you live, I promise you there's probably a synagogue or pulpit rabbi who would love to come in and speak, right? Oftentimes, Jewish ERG leaders are like, if only I knew somebody who knew something about you know, this Jewish holiday. There are tons of rabbis all over America, um, and they often, they love to come in, and they do like a, you know, Hanukkah's coming up, and they'll come up with some kind of universal theme that relates to people within the Jewish ERG, beyond the Jewish ERG. So I'd say, don't forget your local pulpit rabbi, because they often really would welcome the opportunity to come in and do some creative programming, and obviously, bagels. I'll just add that the ADLs had lots of resources for many, many, many years, like how to talk to your employer about the high holy days and the days that you need off and, and if you're struggling with that. So a lot of it you don't have to recreate because um, some of these issues were uh, not at the forefront, but were still issues that ADL and other organizations were handling. Um, so, and your DEI professionals at your firm may have really good ideas or your business. Um, for what you can do. So I think for a lot of it, it's not gonna be a, a heavy lift if your employer um, is welcome to the idea. Absolutely, and I guess I wanna, and I'm gonna look to Wendy for the EEOC head nod on this for sure. Um, but it's important for employees to remember that coming to an employer and suggesting that they have concerns about discrimination in the workplace, that we have retaliation anti-retaliation provisions. And so someone can bring up that conversation. I, we're getting plenty of questions that say, you know, this may not turn vote out, so this may not be a great career move for me. Um, but that we have the law to address that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So opposing something that may be illegal under our statute is also protected. It's not just, you know, filing a charge, et cetera. Opposition is protected under the, our statute. And I just want to note that if people aren't willing to speak up, even though it may be scary, if no one's willing to speak up, some of these things aren't going to change. And, you know, so if you speak up or you may file a charge or things like that, that that's one of the ways that something will change. So, you know, it can be scary, but please do feel free to speak up and realize that that, um, that speaking up is protected under our statutes. Um, some really great questions about the, you know, we started kind of framing with 10-7 and jumping for the modern workplace. Um, a bunch of kind of modern workplace spaces talking about Slack and Teams and messaging between employees that's going on. Um, any suggestions on how to address that? It's kind of employee communication, but it's not, not necessarily face-to-face. -face. Um, what are you seeing in those spaces of somebody on a, you know, a, a board or even individually saying something that an employee wants to address with a co-employee? This was actually a huge topic at the convening that we did, and I didn't know that it was an issue until then, um, particularly Slack channels of different ERGs, right? So the leaders of Jewish ERGs were talking about how their own Slack channels, like people were sort of venting and saying things that they would say in you know, close company, but actually like, no, it's still kind of a, a corporate Slack channel. So 
many Jewish ERG leaders have had to develop, like other ERG leaders, policies around the things that we should and should not speak about using the company Slack channel. I know that um, many of them have actually offered to share those chat guidelines with others, so we're happy to also be a resource on that front as well. Yeah, and just from a legal perspective, keep in mind that if you're using the company's Slack channel, that can contribute at some point to a hostile work environment claim. Right. And even some external conduct, conduct, if it's coming into the workplace, then before you know it, that's a hostile work environment claim waiting to happen. So if you're, you're working for a company and you're interacting with fellow employees, with supervisors, et cetera, I would be very careful and make sure that you're talking in an appropriate manner. And you know, in the federal yeah. sector, we're very careful about this because you know we have extra duties, but just even in the private sector as well, be careful on those government, you know, on those, see I'm in my government mode, be careful on you know a Slack channel sponsored by your company and be careful when you're talking with coworkers that you're doing in an appropriate manner. Thank you. Based on the way questions are coming in, we will be here from now to forum <laughs> if we're going to finish them. So I suggest that we do make it on time to our closing session that starts at 3.30. But I hope that you have enjoyed this program. I know I have learned a lot from our panel and from all of you. I thank you for being here and supporting ADL Commission in our fight against hate. And remember to tap out for CLE credit at the end. Thank you. Thanks.